A hundred years ago, most lifts were driven by trained operators. The technology was there to replace them, but people just didn't feel comfortable with the idea of automation. Level one, please. And then lift designers made some small but groundbreaking changes. First floor Christmas lectures. Add that to a stop button and some relaxing music and suddenly trust in automated lift sort. And here we are today. But what about today? Should we trust the machines that surround us or are we right to be cautious? I'm Dr. Hannah Fry, and tonight we're going to ask whether we should trust the maths. Just how far should we be going with our mathematical skills? And uh, let's demonstrate those mathematical skills first off, because we are joined by Scott Hamlin and your BMX bike. Hello. And a uh, rather carefully placed ramp just here. Very careful indeed, yeah, to make sure it's absolutely amazing. And you've been in since uh, 8 o'clock this morning calculating exactly where this ramp should be, shape of the ramp, everything. Because it's quite a short space that we've got in here. Yes, yeah, so absolutely. We need to make sure that we can get enough velocity to give us lift off the ramp. And I need to use my personal calculations, aka okay, instincts, to be able to perform my stunts and stop before we uh, crash into the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and when you say stunts, Scott, what are you going to do? Well, it depends. It might be a backflip if people want to see one. <laughs> do you want to see a backflip? <laughs> yeah, I want to see a backflip. All right, Scott, you ready to give us a go? Are you guys ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. <laughs> go on it. <laughs> we'll give you a countdown, Scott, when you're in place. <laughs> here we go. And then I'm going to get really far out of the way. <laughs> OK, whenever you're happy. Right, are we ready? Yeah. You happy, Scott? I didn't hear the kids. <laughs> Are you guys ready for this? Yeah! All right, we're going to give you a countdown, Scott. Go for it. Five, four, three, two, one, go! Woo! <laughs> I'm, I'm alive. <laughs> Well done, Scott. That was some tight calculations going on there. Yes, it certainly was. I'm glad it paid off. Thanks to you guys for making the noise. Well, no, thank you to you. Scott Hamlin, thank you very much. Now, OK, we all know that math is amazing, this kind of stuff. It's out there in physics and engineering. It's doing a brilliant job. Just as long as you do your sums correctly. But I want to tell you a little story about a bridge that I think demonstrates that's quite a lot easier said than done. Because this here, this is the, uh, this is the Millennium Bridge in London. Uh, it had its grand opening in the year 2000. But you might also know this bridge by its nickname. This is known as the Wobbly Bridge because of something that happened very soon after it opened. Uh, now, all bridges, including this one, they're built to move left and right just a little bit. It's no biggie. Uh, but there was something about this particular bridge uh, that the designers just hadn't thought of. They'd missed off something quite important in their equations. Let me explain what happened here uh, with one of these, a little metronome. Now this thing here, these ticks and tops in time. If I wanted to write a set of equations for this metronome, it'd be quite simple, some very straightforward physics. And if I wanted to write some equations for a number of metronomes, I'd just do the same thing over and over again, right? It's not like these things can communicate with one another. I can treat each one as though um, they're completely individual. But now let's see what happens when they're on a bridge 
with just a little bit of movement because something rather intriguing happens. I don't want that to fall too far. Let's go from there. Okay, let's see what happens when these things are on a bridge that can move itself left and right just a little bit. Okay, so now that these things can move left and right, something a little bit unusual happens because every time that a metronome is ticking or talking in one direction, that left and right movement means that the whole bridge will just be knocked ever so slightly left and right. And what that means is that now these metronomes can effectively start listening to each other. They're all now connected by the bridge, which means that very, very slowly, you just see it moving very slightly there, left and right. And very slowly, they start to synchronize with one another. Like a creepy metronome army, huh? <laughs> Um, now, this is something that my equations just wouldn't have taken into account. But uh, humans, like metronomes, actually have to be handled with quite a lot of care. And so for that, I'm going to put you in the very capable hands of my good friend and mathematician, Matt Parker. Oh, hey. So, thanks, Hannah. I'm over here in the library at the Royal Institution, where instead of very small metronomes, we have a massive wobbly bridge simulator. We've borrowed this from the University of Cambridge. They use it to test things like, uh, well, full-size bridges. It's a very firm structure with a tray attached to it, which is able to move a little bit side to side. We've got two treadmills. I'm joined by Dylan here, who's going to walk on one of these treadmills with me. So if we turn these on, in theory, we'll start uh, walking slowly to start with. There we go. And then should we go up to four? Let's try a speed of four. So now we are trying to walk on a bridge which uh, is not staying still at all. And it feels a bit like being on a boat maybe where it's moving around and you're trying to compensate for that movement. And it means we have perfectly synced up our walking and that's causing it to move, I'd say a concerning amount. Yeah, you're keeping a brave face, but it's terrifying up here. All our movements is causing it to shift backwards and forwards. Hannah, you can imagine what would happen if you had loads of people doing this on a much bigger structure. Just imagine indeed, but it turns out this is precisely what happened. Because the people who designed the Millennium Bridge hadn't taken into account the fact that people can affect each other with the way that they're walking. So those very small movements left to right suddenly became a very big deal. And it meant that on the opening day, you had hundreds of people walking over an 18 million pound bridge. The beginning of a new millennium, and every single one of them was hanging on for dear life. Look at that. That's a... Uh, British ingenuity at its finest, um, just there. But there is an important point in all of this with wobbly bridges and BMX bikes. Maths can do an amazing job, but only if your equations actually match up to the world that you're describing. Just as long as you've got the right equations for bikes and bridges, you can be certain of what's going to happen next. But there are some things that are quite hard to write equations for in the first place. So, OK, let's imagine that it's long into the future and you're trying to write an algorithm that can help a doctor work out what's wrong with their patients. Now, a doctor's job is quite different to that of an engineer or a physicist, because if someone just comes in with a headache, a doctor can't just take measurements uh, of what's wrong and end up with an exact answer, because that headache it could mean a whole host of different things, right? Somehow, the doctor has to use a whole bunch of clues to build a picture of what might be wrong with you. Now, this is the difference between calculating the answer and just making your best possible guess. And no one had any idea how to do that in, in an equation until the 1700s, when the Reverend Thomas Bayes thought of a very clever game. Now, we are going to play a version of this game, just with a little bit more fire. Um, so who would like uh, to come down and volunteer for this? Um, let's go. Let's go for you, just there. Round of applause. She comes to the stage. Okay. What's your name? Emma. Emma? Yeah. Okay, Emma. Um, right, what we're going to do is we're going to play a version of this game um, and it involves uh, this red hat, if you don't mind just popping that on your head. Now, just so that we can get uh, your view of things. Oh, it's a bit... <laughs> Hold on one second, let me tighten this up. There we go. Now, just so we can get your view of things, I've also got uh, a version of this red hat um, over here for this camera, so we'll be able to see what you see. Um, now, the other thing that we need for this game is a whole host of balloons, which are just coming on, just coming on behind you. Um, if you want to turn around, Emma, just have a little look. Just have a little look at these balloons. Um, what colour are these balloons, Emma? 
You want to stand over here, actually. Just stand Red. over here. What colour are the balloons? Red. Red. OK, so if we look through this camera now, um, we will be able to see that they do indeed all look red. And yet, to... Just want to step up here, sorry. And yet, to everyone in this audience, we can see that, in fact, what you're looking at are 99 orange balloons and one yellow one. Now, we all know where the yellow balloon is. No one's allowed to give it away. But your job, Emma, is to try and pop that yellow balloon. And if you manage it, we're all gonna, we're all gonna explode in excitement. Uh, and if you fail, we're gonna respond with disappointed silence, okay? <laughs> um, so here we go. You get to pick a balloon at random and, uh, and, and pop one. Which one do you wanna pop? You stand here and Matt will do it. Um, up, up. Down. This one? Yeah. Perfect. That one, that one there? Yeah. Ready? Here we go. That is not the yellow balloon. That's okay there. I mean, it's pretty hard in the beginning. What was, I mean, you know, there's, uh, how can you possibly guess it first time? So what we're going to do as an audience, we're going to help her here. Um, so we are going to tell you, when on my cue, we're going to tell you if based on the last balloon that you popped, whether you should go higher or lower, left or right, right? So if you think it's higher, say higher. If you think it's lower, say lower. Uh, if you think it's neither higher nor lower, then I want exactly 50% of you to say higher, 50% of you to say lower, and I'll let you work out between yourselves um, which one is which. Okay, uh, so based on her last balloon pop, should she go higher or lower? Lower! And should she go left or right? Left! Okay, where do you want to pop? That one. That one. Ready? Oh, okay. We'll give her another go. Do you want to go, based on the last balloon pop, should she go higher or lower? Lower. And should she go left or right? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. Which way do you want to go? Down. Down. That one. Ready? Oh. Thank you so much, Emma. You got there amazingly quickly. Okay, do you want to take this? this tell me about that. How, what was your strategy in the first place? Just pick one. Just pick one at random. You're just yeah. getting it random. And did our clues help you to hone yeah. in on the answer? You, you knew probably where the balloon was by the end. Yeah. Were you getting more and more confident? Yeah. Yes, perfect. All right, Emma, thank you so much. It was amazing. <laughs> What Emma was doing there, she was, she was demonstrating something that's called Bayesian thinking. And actually, it's something that all of us do instinctively. But it wasn't until Bayes thought of a, a version of that game uh, that the world realised that you can actually write down that way of thinking into an equation. And I'm really not exaggerating when I tell you that that Bayes theorem is one of the most important equations of all time. Because suddenly... It doesn't matter if you're not completely sure of the answer. You can still get a really good sense of the right answer, even from incomplete pieces of information. And that is something that is incredibly useful. Let me show you. So, OK, let's imagine that you are making a, a driverless car. Now, uh, it hasn't got a driver in it, so you need to make sure that you know where you are. And, OK, you could use GPS to do that. But GPS, it isn't perfect. So sometimes your GPS will, will get your position out by about a metre or so. And if you're a human, that's fine, no big deal. You can, you can work out where you are. But if you're a driverless car, the difference of a few metres can mean the difference between driving on the pavement and uh, driving into oncoming traffic, which isn't ideal. So driverless cars, they also have cameras on board. Now, cameras are pretty good at letting you know where you are, but again, they're not perfect because uh, skies look a lot like water um, and, uh, you know, lorry tarpaulin looks a lot like a clouded sky. The point about driverless cars is that you don't just have one thing that gives you exactly where you are. You have lots of different things that you use as clues to indicate where you are. And that is something that is especially important when you are driving at 200 miles an hour. So this thing here, this is the world's fastest autonomous car. It's built for racing and it's got all kinds of different sensors to help it work out where it is. So it's got uh, little cameras here. It's got uh, another kind of camera called LiDAR over here. It's got uh, radar over here at the back. All of these are the clues for the car and GPS within this, uh, the computer that's just inside here. Now this thing 
It's basically a Bayesian machine. So that computer that is the size of just a, a lunchbox is churning through trillions of calculations every second to make sure that this car knows where it is and finishes the race as quickly as possible, all while avoiding other competitors. I think that's the thing about how these modern inventions work. That's how they deal with uncertainty. They don't just have one sensor, they don't just have two sensors, they have a whole host of sensors that they use to layer up and give them information. That's something that's true of, uh, of driverless cars, but it's also true of this little guy here, who I believe is going to follow me into the studio. There we go. Come on in. Come on, come on. Oh, that was a lovely landing. Right, I want you to join me in welcoming to the stage Duncan and the Skyports Drone. <laughs> this is quite some drone, Duncan. This is, this is quite a big one. This is one of our delivery drones, so we can do medical samples or e-commerce deliveries with this one. So what kind of things is this used for then? So we do um, blood samples, we can do them between hospitals and medical facilities, we can do packages, we were flying them in Finland recently. Basically anything you can fit in that box, up to about five kilograms, we can fly it. So how does this thing avoid crashing? It's got a number of systems on it. It's got 4G, just like the mobile phone. It's got a, um, a Wi-Fi network of its own. And it's also got, if all else fails, a satellite communications network. What's this thing over here? What's this little bit here? That's, uh, that's the failsafe. So if everything goes wrong, that's a parachute. And that will deploy. So for example, if one of the rotors stops or one of the motors doesn't work, be a big alarm that goes off, that will deploy and it will come down to Earth very safely. So it needs all of those different systems running in parallel? It needs them all running in parallel. Hopefully you only ever use one of them. But yeah. the rest we call redundancy. It's there just in case something goes wrong. So what's the future of drones like this then? So this is uh, becoming more and more prevalent. We're flying um, in Africa, we're doing snake bite anti-venom, so uh, very urgent stuff, often very bad road networks. We're um, flying in the west coast of Scotland, doing some medical samples again. Ultimately, it will come into cities, uh, much more complex environments. You've got lots more people, lots more buildings, lots more things to keep out of the way of. But you know, the technology is there is good enough now that you can fly pretty much any environment. Uh, talking of people, could I ever get a, a personal passenger drone? You can. Uh, in fact, you can already. So this is your company, personal passenger drones, are they? Yeah, so this is a company called Volocopter, and um, these are live. They're going through certification now. Within two years, everybody here will be able to get in one of these and fly around. Within two years? Within two years. Goodness me. Will our skies be full of them in the future then, do you think? The airspace is vast. Cities are now very dense. It's hard to put more infrastructure into cities. These can fly in our, in our underutilised air. Amazing, Duncan, a view of the future there, I think. Big round of applause if you can. Thank Thank you. You. Now, Duncan was talking a lot there about having backups on backups and backups uh, just to make sure that if there's ever a problem, you know that the, the drone won't crash. And that is something, actually, that Matt Parker uh, has been thinking about, too. Yes, and I've brought a comedy oversized slice of cheese. A slice of cheese. Slice of cheese. Okay, all right. Because when a lot of people are thinking about things like drones and trying to avoid disasters, they find it's useful to think of it in terms of cheese. Okay. And so things can go wrong with drones. You can have one of the motors might break, the battery might run out of charge, and when that happens, you don't want it to crash into people and cause a disaster. So you imagine these, these mistakes, these errors coming at your system, and you put in barriers, like, so, like a slice of cheese to stop them from making it, bear with me, making it through and becoming a disaster. So this could be, for example, like the GPS system. Okay. So it's tracking where it is, everything that goes wrong, it shouldn't be a disaster. What's the holes though? Well, well spotted. So GPS, as you know, is not perfect. Like you were saying, you could be on the sidewalk according to the GPS. And so it might be inaccurate, it might be giving you the wrong data. No one layer to try and stop disasters will be perfect. So this is trying to block disasters from happening 
Mostly it works, but just occasionally it's going to fail. Occasionally a mistake will slip through and GPS okay. won't be enough. Okay. But if you see over here, we've got more cheese. <laughs> so if you'd like to take a seat here okay. under the cheese. Go on. So it's fine. Are you sure? You trust the maths. Here we go. I'm not sure I trust you though, Matt. That's wise. Very wise. <laughs> so this is another slice of cheese and this one is the parachute. So if the big drone fails and the GPS is wrong, the parachute will deploy. Okay. And so with two layers together... They both got, this one's got holes in it as well. Well, though. that's true. But what we hope is the holes in this layer don't line up with the holes in the other layers. Mm -hmm. And actually we can get another layer. This one's just called rules which doesn't sound very exciting, but we all need rules. <laughs> so when we brought the drone in here, we weren't allowed to fly it above a crowd. And that's one of the rules for using a drone. And sure. So even if an accident happens, yeah. even if the parachute fails and the GPS fails, at least people won't get hurt. In theory, if you're following the rules, it'll be fine. Although, of course, sometimes people break the rules and you hope the other layers will help you out. And so I'm just going to grab a camera so I can show you a point of view. Thank you. Uh, can I just... You know what, Matt? I mean, it's not that I don't trust you. No, it's literally that you don't trust no, me. No, it's literally that I don't okay. trust you. So if you have a look from Hannah's <laughs> point of view underneath, you can see up through some holes, but then almost straight away it's blocked by a different slice of cheese. And the point of view of the top, here you go. Again, there are some holes that go part way down, but then they stop. So what we're going to do now is rain some errors down on you. We've got a whole bucket of errors. And in theory, if we drip them down, while they will make it through some of the slices of cheese, they will be stopped by the, more, more errors, more errors, right? And so some of them are being stopped by the first layer, some of them are getting through the first layer, but they're stopped by the next layer. And so okay, in theory... Okay, I get this, I get it, I get it, I get it. Because, yeah, overall, <laughs> overall it's fine, right? Like all of these different layers are blocking, yeah. blocking it from happening. And so even though any one individual layer, you're like, oh, look at all those holes in it, if you sit down and you look through the whole lot at once, you're like, ah, that's amazing. From here, I can't see any hole which goes the entire way through. That's good, but then, Matt, what happens if the holes do go the entire now, way through? Now, that's a good point, because every... <laughs> you make a valid point. I think we need more we'll errors. it in an interesting more errors. way. More no. errors. <laughs> I'm trying to make a serious point here <laughs> that occasionally your cheese holes will line up and a few mistakes normally will make it through and become a disaster. And there's nothing you can do about that. Nothing you can do about it. Disasters, Matt, are inevitable. Uh, yep, I'm coming to terms with that as we speak. Matt Parker, <laughs> round of applause. Thank you very much. So this is the really big downside of uncertainty. You have to accept that perfection is impossible. Mistakes are effectively inevitable. And I think that that raises a very big and important question. If we know for sure that our algorithms are never going to be perfect, do we want to put them in charge of making decisions, especially in situations where people's lives are at stake, like in the courtroom? Now, someone who's thought about this a lot is Professor Katie Atkinson. Katie, Hello. the courtroom it doesn't feel like a natural place where you would find mathematics. Well, perhaps not, but actually AI and law researchers are working on building models of legal reasoning using mathematical models that are then turned into software programs that can help judges and lawyers. Why do they need them, though? Why can't the judges just do it all themselves? Well, the point of using these mathematical models is that we can get consistent, efficient decisions and then we know that any kind of unconscious biases are being stripped out. So, so judges make mistakes, they have unconscious biases and the idea is that using algorithms can help to, to minimise that, right? Yep, that's absolutely right, so we're hoping these can help. So I understand that you brought a little friend along to uh, help us understand what's going on here. Yeah, that's right, this is Pepper the Robot. Pepper the Robot, hello Pepper. All rise for the courts that will decide the case of Papa v. Hayashi.
So this links us to a legal case that was in uh, the United States and involved a baseball and people catching and dropping a baseball. So someone hit a baseball into the crowd and then two people forced over the baseball at the last minute. This baseball was very valuable, wasn't it? Indeed, it was worth $450,000 in oh, the end. Oh, crikey. So I can understand why two people were particularly upset. Yeah. OK, so what we have to do is, first of all, work out what the facts of the case are and then we have to work out what the arguments are for the two different sides within the legal case. And that's what Pepper's going to help us with. That's right. So the facts of the case are that Mr Popoff stopped the forward motion of the ball once it was hit into the crowd. He tried to get it under control but then he was thrown to the ground by this mob who were also trying to secure the baseball. Which oh, sounds a bit unfair really if you're, you know, you caught it and then it's not your fault. That's right. So that's why he felt that he should have been given the opportunity to complete the catch. And then Mr Hayashi found the loose ball on the floor and he picked it up and claimed it as his. OK. Well, I mean, he was the one who ended up with it at the end. That kind of seems like he's got a fair claim too. That's right. And in particular, he wasn't part of this mob that threw Mr Popoff to the ground. So he did no wrong either. So he shouldn't be punished. And that's really the facts and the arguments of the case. So you can take all of those facts and arguments of the case, put them into equations, compare them to cases that were like this in the past. And then ultimately, can the algorithm give us a verdict? Yeah, that's right. OK, Pepper, what's the verdict in this case then? The decision of this court is that the ball should be sold at auction and the proceeds split evenly between Mr. Popoff and Mr. Hayashi. OK, that's very clear. I mean, we're having lots of fun here with a humanoid robot, but it's, it's not the intention to actually have humanoid robots in courtrooms, is it? That's absolutely right. We're aiming at writing these mathematical models that we're turning into AI tools that will be on a computer and helping judges and lawyers who are sat there using these for decision support. It's all the stuff inside Pepper, not Pepper herself. That's right. I, I can't imagine us seeing Pepper in a court anytime <laughs> soon. If she's sending you off to jail, <laughs> looking like that, no. No, certainly not. <laughs> this example sounds like a very positive thing you could get through I imagine like a big backlog of, of, of cases with something like this on your side but algorithms in the courtroom they're not sort of they haven't been universally positive have they? Yeah that's right so there is a big issue of trust as well as whether the actual technology works in itself. Because if you're putting all of history into a series of equations I mean history wasn't exactly fair was it? I that's guess. right and we want to make these decisions as fair as we possibly can and get AI technologies to help us do this. I quite agree. Katie thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. <laughs> Katie made a really important point in all of that because if all you're doing is just chucking in everything that happened in the past to your equations, then you're going to perpetuate all of society's biggest imbalances going forward. And a machine is only ever as good as the data that it's trained on. Um, let me show you what I'm talking about here uh, because I'd like you to welcome uh, back to the stage Matt Parker with a very special shoe detecting machine. <laughs> I, I bring a range of shirts. So <laughs> this? this is my shoe detecting device, okay. which you can have a go. Ooh, okay. I call it uh, Shoe Do You Think You Are. Okay, got you. And Very nice. if you point it at something, it can tell you if it's a shoe or not. Ooh, okay. All right, let me give it a go. Let's try your face. Okay, that is not a shoe. Uh, not okay, a shoe. Correct. All right, Thank let's try it. Let's try your oh, shoes. Oh, okay, yep. Oh, hang on. It says they're not shoes. Oh, the device is fine. We just haven't trained it yet. Oh. We have to put in some training data. You were here for lecture two. I was, right? I was. And so we've got to teach it what a shoe looks like, and then it'll be amazing. Okay, all right then. So let's get a group of people to help me uh, train this shoe. Uh, so let's get some people from over here. Let's get that little column up there and up on, here. If you guys all want to come down and help me train this machine, round of applause, they come to the stage. OK, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you 20 seconds, and I would just like you to draw a picture of a shoe that can scan into the machine. Here we go. Two, one, stop. OK, all right, let's, uh, let's turn those around, hold them up to the camera, we'll have a little look. Let's scan these. OK, so we've got some lacy numbers, some nice a top shot of a shoe there. This is great, lots of laces. You've got some trainers there. This is all perfect. OK, great, perfect. It's all, I think it's all trained, Matt. So uh, let's give it a go. Let's, uh, let's try your shoes there. OK, perfect. Spotted your shoes. Amazing, it's great. It is works. it detecting shoes? Yeah, 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 look. 
Pebbles. Yeah, oh, perfect. Amazing. That's amazing. That's great. So can I just pop it's through really and get good. a closer look? That's incredible. Oh, okay. Nice. Um, and it's not failed yet on any of these near identical shoes. No, no. That's. I mean, you did all draw very really similar shoes. Let's try this one. Oh no, it's, uh, no. It doesn't it doesn't detect your shoes at all? Well, you need a much more diverse range of training. I'm, I'm very disappointed in all of you. <laughs> I mean, guys, you did just basically draw your own shoes. So let's try again. Let's try again. Turn the turn your paper around. Try again, and this time, try and think of as wide a range of shoes as possible. Off you go. Three, two, one. Stop. Okay, here we go. Let's get this in scanning mode. We're ready to go. Do you want to turn it around? Hold it up to the camera. It's That's it's. I mean, it looks pretty much like a shoe. This is pretty good. This is great. We've got some high heels. Lots of high heels. We've got flip flops. We've got boots. We've got uh, you know some wellies there. This is lovely ballerina shoe. That's great. Okay, perfect. All right, Matt. I think it's good now. I think it's, it's got to be good now. It's got to be good now. Let's. Uh, surely this works on all shoes now. I okay, let's have a closer look at it. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> shoe. Shoe. Not shoe. Not a shoe. I mean, shoe. That's that's debatable whether that's a shoe. It's definitely footwear. <laughs> okay, let's give it a um, go. With the right data, it could have detected that as a shoe. That's, this is true with the right data. But I think the point here is that even when you know to draw as diverse a range of shoes as possible, uh, it's actually just really hard to think of everything. It's just unbelievable. <laughs> Thank you very much, Matt. And a round of applause for all of our volunteers. Thank you very much. Now there is a really important point in all of this because if you don't think through all of the possible situations that your, your machine needs to include, it can end up having very big uh, real life consequences. To tell us a little bit more, please join me in welcoming from the University of York, an expert in image recognition for surveillance, Dr. Kofi Appiah. Hey, hey, hey. Now, Kofi, you've done a lot of work in uh, facial recognition before, yeah, right? That's right. Tell me, how does facial detection work? So for face detection, all that we need is to be able to pick out the elements of the face, which is the eye, the key features, the eye, the nose, the mouth. And to be able to pick up these features, the, there's a big contrast that we can find between the eye and the eyelashes, the eyelashes and the skin itself, when it comes to the mouth, the lips, you have an edge there. So this is the big contrast that we're able to pick. And as far as we're able to find eyes, nose, mouth, we've got a face. So is it looking, is it, so if I come over here then to this one here, so is yes. it looking for areas of light and dark? So like on my nose, for instance, yes. it's kind of darker on either side and then lighter down the middle. That's correct. And then if it gets a strip of like darker pixels and lighter pixels, it's nose, it's found a nose. That's right. So it's looking for these key features. This is what face normally will have. Okay. These are the key features and that's and what eyes. we train our systems to be able to recognise. Just one thing though, Kofi, that I'm noticing here. It's getting my face okay, but... Right. So it's not able to uh, pick my face and it's relating to the data that you just mentioned. This system has not been trained with enough data. What the, the contrasting features that you've got between your eyebrow and the skin texture is f different from mine. And it's not picking it up. So in this case, I'm going to have this. It's picking up as a face because it can pick some of the salient features that I was talking about. It's going to put a bounding box around it. Whereas in my case, no. Pick it. But this, I mean, this stuff is actually, you know, it's a, it's a really big deal. It's not just in, in cameras. I mean, we're now seeing facial detection in all kinds of things, passport cues, That's for instance. That's right, yes, yeah. So obviously in this case, you go face like me, unfortunately, it's going to be a long delay for you. We do, you do, using it in law enforcement as well. And if, example, if it's not able to pick the right face, you're going to be uh, prosecuted for something that you've not done. We're using this facial recognition to be able to unlock phones. It's like a password now. So if uh, it's not working right, look at the harm that it can do. Is it, uh, is it improving? Are the algorithms getting better? Yes, it's getting better and better. And the, what they're trying to do is to make it non-biased by training with diverse non-biased data sets. So uh, as you can see, you can pick some of the features, pick mine. You can w also come and works for a whole different range of faces. If you try to fit that. Uh, so it, it's improving uh, over time and uh, we're getting there. Obviously the issues of bias um, and fairness are incredibly important when it comes to, to facial recognition. But there is another concern that people have when it comes to uh, this technology, which is that some people don't like the idea that they can be identified in a crowd based on their facial features. Some people don't like the idea of losing their anonymity. So some people have been experimenting with different ways to try and trick facial recognition cameras. And uh, 
We are lucky to be joined from uh, Glow Up by uh, makeup artist Tiffany Hunt and Eva. <laughs> <laughs> you are standing right here. Come on in. Okay, now, uh, Eva, you have had, uh, as we can see, uh, Tiffany has been doing your makeup for a little while um, backstage. Looks very uh, remarkable. Is this the kind of thing that would work on uh, to, to full facial detection? Oh, yeah, so this kind of system, because it's looking for that contrasting. Uh, be between the eye, the eyelashes, the nose. But the way the face is being painted now, it's breaking all the symmetry. Like, it can't find it, uh, the nose. So, Tiffany, talk us through what you were, what you were going for here. I mean, it's, it's quite dramatic. <laughs> just a bit, just something like natural. Um, <laughs> so, basically, what I was thinking was something that was a monochromatic illusion. So, I really wanted to break up specific facial features, such as, like, this sort of area, the central area of the face, which is sort of the area that gets picked up the most. Also, like, sort of changing the eye shape, the lashes, and just really going for something with like colours that are just so different to your usual skin tone and just changing your face totally, really. Do you like it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Friday night out. Yeah. <laughs> but the proof is in the pudding, let's have a look. So, Tiffany, we're picking you up. Can you step oh. to one side? It's not getting you at all. <laughs> <laughs> not getting you at all. I think a big round of applause there for the dazzle makeup. Very impressive to Eva, Tiffany and Kofi. Thank you very much, everyone. We've got some ways now that we know we can avoid uh, being detected by facial recognition cameras. Might look a little bit crazy if you're wandering around with that all the time. Um, but when it comes to protecting our privacy, there are some people who are worried that even this won't be enough. There are some people who are worried that with the help of mathematical algorithms, we are building and processing vast profiles on each and every one of us, often without our knowledge. Now, to explain this, please welcome to the stage computer scientist extraordinaire, Dr. Amory Imaphodon. Marie, do you think that we're seeing the death of privacy? In some ways we are, in other ways we aren't. I know if you go back far enough, we used to communicate with fire and smoke signals or by yelling things long distances. Not that long ago, really. <laughs> yeah, basically. Um, but now, with the algorithms that we have and the time that we spend online, really in-depth profiles are being built up on all of us continuously. And it's those profiles that are connecting pieces of information together, right? That's kind of the big thing. Exactly. So where those things might not have been private before, being able to connect them together to build up that picture of someone uh, was harder, whereas now it's very easy. And we use things like social media where we're putting that yeah, information voluntarily. out. voluntarily. Exactly. So the profiles are pretty complex. Okay, so to give us a sense of uh, these kind of profiles, I wanted to get, uh, let's say, three volunteers here because amory has got a little demonstration for us. Okay, perfect. All right. Uh, okay, perfect. Right, we'll go for you. You, you get to come down. Let's go, for, let's go for you there, the jumper, and you there, the stripey jumper. Let's, let's bring him down to the stage. Come back. What's your name? Again. Natasha. Okay, perfect. Natasha, if you want to go there, what was your name? Kieran. Kieran. Okay, perfect. Yeah, do you want to go there, Kieran? And what was your name? Caitlin. Caitlin. Perfect. Caitlin, you jump, you jump around there. Okay, perfect. Anne Marie uh, is going to talk us through a little demonstration. Yes. So each of you uh, have got a website that we've loaded up for you on your laptop there. Um, and I want to make sure you've accepted cookies and I'd like you to get clicking and browsing on these sites and doing some cool things. Um, and as you've accepted cookies, I'm going to give each of you a cookie. <laughs> they are rather large cookies. Thank you very much. <laughs> so as you're browsing and you're clicking around, you have this cookie in your site, um, in your laptop, um, and there's different data and information that you're putting in. So I can see you here, you're about to watch some YouTube videos. Um, I can see which channel that you're on, so I'm going to pop a little bit of a chocolate chip there. That's some data. I can see the artist that you've got as well, so I'm going to pop a little bit more data on your chocolate chip uh, cookie. You can see your shopping here. Brilliant curtains, so that's a good bit of data. <laughs> She's got a new house and she likes blue and white curtains. So two more bits of data that we've got there, fantastic. Um, I think you've added them to your basket as well. So we're going to add that into your cookie just so that when you come back, you don't need to browse blue and white curtains again. And just over here, we're looking at your address. So that's a bit of data. 
and I can see you're getting directions to school. So that's even more data that we've got popped in This there. is a lot of data now, Emery. Really... A lot of data just from browsing and entering information that is going into these cookies that are stored on their laptops. Now, if you stop browsing now, you'll see that we've got quite a lot of data on these cookies. And these cookies don't just stay within your laptop. Um, many of you might have accepted cookies that have got third-party uh, sites as well. So here's our third-party site. What sites. does that mean then? And you actually get that data as well from their cookies. So what? you know it's blue-white uh, curtains that she's looking for. So if you accept third-party cookies, that means another person can just buy that data and add it to a whole host of other data that they've got from all loads of other websites and build this incredibly detailed profile. That's exactly what's happening. I mean, do we realise that's what we're really doing when we're clicking around? Probably not. Okay, but the thing is, is that it's not just the information that you're clicking on that uh, that builds uh, that helps to build this profile of you it's also things that you are not clicking on too and so for this let me welcome to the stage mark kirstein Websites, don't yes, you? that's right. Um, and uh, you've in fact built a website for us. Yes. So, so let's have a look at this. T talk us through what you've so built. So this is just a web page that I've created that lists a bunch of animals. Okay, perfect. All right. So what I'd like you to do, um, if it's okay, is just have a little look through this and uh, just you know have a little flick through and stop on, on on and have a little read of whichever one whichever one you think um, ends up being being particularly interesting. Uh, happy? Have you stopped on one? Have you picked one? Yep. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, now, Mark. Which one did you pick? I believe that would be the dog, is that correct? And how yeah. did you know that? Yes, so it's not just about the information you're actively putting in, but it's enough to simply scroll through something uh, to find out uh, what someone's thinking of. So in this case, uh, this web page, as you scroll through, you're seeing the different animals that are being looked at in real time being transmitted to the server. So, Amory, websites aren't just tracking what you're clicking on, they're tracking on what you're pausing on. Yeah, how fast your mouse is moving, the kind of device that you're using to access the website. They can even tell the difference between a click and a tap. Um, but often there's even more, so things like your IP address, which might give a clue as to where you are physically browsing from. Just imagine how much information you could get on someone if you're a professional company that had been doing it for years, Anne-Marie. Exactly, and that's why it's so valuable. There's so many insights that we can pick up from lots of different websites. There's so many of us that are using these platforms, and so those cookies are pretty valuable over time to lots of different people. Incredibly valuable indeed. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you, Anne -Marie. We're not saying that it's necessarily bad, but I think it is important to realise just exactly how much we are uh, giving away. Because I think if someone can work out what kind of person you are, they can use that information to target you with very precisely tailored messages. Now, that might be adverts to uh, persuade you to buy something, but it might also be linked to political messages to persuade you to, to vote in a certain way. And that is something that's been in the news uh, a, a lot recently. But I think it is important to remember this is kind of how our whole online world uh, is designed to work. But what makes people particularly unhappy is when that targeting happens with fake news. But even there, there is maths hiding behind the scenes. Because with algorithms on your side, it is easier to create realistic fake stuff now than it's ever been before. And I want to show you just how easy it can be to create fake stuff. I want to see if you as an audience are capable of spotting some fake classical music. We're going to play a little game that I like to call Is the Bark Worse Than the Bite? OK? <laughs> I was pretty proud of that, thanks. Um, <laughs> what they're going to do, they're going to play you two pieces of classical music. One of them was composed by the very great Vivaldi, and the other one was composed by a mathematical algorithm in the style of Vivaldi. What I want you to do is to see if you can guess which one is which, OK? So two pieces of music, your job, spot the real Vivaldi. OK, here we go. Piece of music number one.
That was piece of music number one. Here is piece of music number two. One of those was a fake, okay? So you've got to spot which one. If you think that the real Vivaldi was the first song, give me a cheer. <laughs> if you think the second song was the real Vivaldi, give me a cheer. <laughs> I mean, that's basically 50 50, guys. <laughs> Just guessing at random, uh, I see. Uh, and the real answer was which number one was one. number one was the real Vivaldi. Well done if you got that right. <laughs> Now, okay, that fake Vivaldi, it was, it was impressive enough to kind of fool half a room full of people as to, as to which one was real. But the algorithm itself is actually incredibly simple. All you do is you take a catalogue of all of the songs that Vivaldi has ever written, and then you give the algorithm a chord, and then it will tell you with what probability the next chord that was likely to come up in Vivaldi's original music. So what you do, give it a chord, it gives you a chord back based on probability. You give it a chord, it gives you a chord back based on probability. You chain those chords together one after the other until you end up with something that is entirely original. Um, but that, I think, is the, is the real giveaway here about the fact that this is the fake. Those very simple chord transitions that go on in the background. And um, there are other bits though, right? There, I mean, there was one bit at the end there particularly, which, which looked like it was, it was quite difficult. I'm afraid there are passages later on which are impossible to play. Impossible, impossible. to play. Impossible how? Um, at the speed that the artificial intelligence has asked us to play, you physically can't reach the extreme <laughs> ends of the instrument quick enough. And I think that that's an important point. That Vivaldi, he had knowledge of, of how to play instruments. He had knowledge of human hands and human bodies, but the algorithm doesn't. It just kind of shoves loads of stuff in together. Um, but I should tell you that uh, it turns out that you can use this very same idea for lots of other things. You can use it for music, but you can also use it for lyrics. And because it's Christmas, what I decided to do, I decided to feed in some uh, classic Christmas carols, and I decided to train my very own algorithm to uh, create, uh, to generate a whole new carol. Um, and so, for this, Please welcome to the stage Rob Levy and join us for a rendition of a mathematical Christmas carol. Round of applause for Rob Levy. Feel free to, to sing along. It's Christmas time, there's no May ye shepherds quake at turkeys In a pear tree thy candles shine Out in a winter wonderland Now the angels singing in our way Fa la 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 We'll have snow on Christmas day Good girl, Santa must be ding dong, ding dong, ding a dong, a ding a dong. Rob Levy and our string quartet, everybody. Thank you very much. Here's the thing about using math in this very creative way. It's very impressive but it's also not really human. And there is something a little bit uncomfortable about a world where fakes can fool, especially when they're not just mimicking music, but people. To explain, let's welcome Dr. Alex Adam. <laughs> now, Alex, you work in an area called deep fakes, right? That's right. So, what are they? So deepfake algorithms are a special kind of machine learning algorithm that can take, um, say, one person's face or their head or their entire body or their voice and turn it into another person's head. 
So to make face. people look like they've done stuff absolutely. in videos that they've never done. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, that's quite, that's quite something, right? Yeah, you can it's quite, manipulate it's quite scary. You can essentially puppet people. Um, so how does it work? So you imagine if I have a video of you and a video of me. So we take those two videos and we split them up into their sort of individual frames, so the images that make up that video. And we'll show a computer all of those different images of me and you. And what the algorithms will start to learn is they'll start to learn things like um, what's the structure of our different faces and what are the different kinds of expressions that we make. But critically, they learn how to distinguish the two. So one of them will know, OK, I can make red hair and a particular kind of skin tone. And the other one will say I can make brown hair and a particular kind of skin tone. But they'll separate our, out our expressions. So I'll be able to say, OK, I want to take you smiling and put that smile onto me. So, so, it's take, so you're spitting out what your face looks like and what your face is doing. That's exactly and right. And then you can put what your face is doing on my face. Whilst keeping all of your other features the same. OK, OK, That's all right. Exactly so, right. Uh, so we've got a couple of puzzles here. So here's a picture of you then. You're doing a little, uh, a little a snarl. snarl. <laughs> I like that a lot. A little bit of an eyebrow raise as well. OK, so you can make me do this face. Yeah, that's exactly right. How do you do it? So if we just flip that over, so what we can think of is we can think of my expression as having some kind of abstract mathematical representation, which I'm sort of thinking of as these puzzle pieces. And what I can do is I can say, well, piece 32 and say 37 over there correspond to me making this, this snarl. And what I can do is I can just take those pieces, let's imagine I've got them over here, and I can just slot them in over here into your, into your face. So you're shuffling my face around, essentially. Yeah, I'm basically just saying, turn on the bits of your face that will make you make that snarl. OK, great. So once you've completed that jigsaw, if you can flip it over, the yep. idea is that... Ah, oh, there we go. That's a we'll lovely get... snarly face, isn't it? Exactly. <laughs> we'll now get Hannah with the snarl. <laughs> um, are, there, are there concerns about this kind of technology? So, um, like, my day job is I'm a data scientist at faculty, and I work on using um, artificial intelligence techniques to sort of detect these kind of video manipulations. Obviously, there's a lots of implications for the fact that you can just puppet people. I could record a video of myself saying something and just transform it into some uh, celebrity, for example. And this has implications for, say, privacy, but also for, say, democracy and political disinformation. Um, so there are lots of sort of concerns about that, which is why it's important to be able to detect this kind of content online. There are also many great applications, though, like dubbing, special effects, and things like that. Do you have any top tips for spotting deep fakes? Yeah, so I think my, my top tip for sort of spotting deep fakes is always just if you're watching a video of something and you, you sort of suspect that it might be a deep fake, just ask the question, do you really believe that this person would, would do or say these things that the video is portraying? So that's like my number one uh, suggestion. My second suggestion would be sort of do some fact checking, sort of try to see if you can find that video on some trusted, uh, trusted news outlets, particularly if you found it posted on social media or something that's sort of harder to verify. And from a technical perspective, I think it's useful to look for things like objects in the background of the video. So if, as I move, you notice objects in the background of the video moving with me, that's a pretty strong indication that the video is being manipulated. That, I think, is some excellent tips that will only serve us well in the future. <laughs> um, Alex, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Now, we really wanted to show you how this deep fake stuff works. So what we've done is we've been working with Alex's team and we have created a deep fake of someone in the audience. Always good to break boundaries here at the uh, Christmas lectures. So uh, to give this moment the real sense of occasion that it deserves, I would like to introduce you to a brand new talk show. Because tonight, for one night only, please welcome your host. It's Matt Parker and this is your face. <laughs> Welcome to This Is Your Face, and can you please welcome to the stage, tonight's face, it's Kaya! <laughs> Come on down, Kaya. You have to take a seat. So, Kaya, it's great to meet the person behind the face. And to get to know you, my first question is, do you have a favourite food? Yes, I like pizza and pasta. Pizza and pasta? That's yeah. pretty pizza uncontroversial. And pizza and pasta? No, we're not having that. Let's have another go. I really like vegetables. Just plain old vegetables, especially Brussels sprouts, actually. That's, that's number one. And often maybe with a side of extra vegetables. Well, Kaya, that is your face. 
My next question, do you have a favorite type of animal? Yeah, I love cats. You love cats? They're pretty adorable, aren't they? Yeah. Have you got like a least favorite creature? Uh, probably insects. In you don't like insects? No. Oh, interesting. interesting. Hmm. Let's see, shall we? I just love ants. I think they're amazing. I love the idea of them like crawling all over me, in my hair, up my nose, in my ears. <laughs> just like a massive swarm of ants everywhere. Oh, Kai, you better talk to your face. <laughs> now, my last question. You've got a younger sister, haven't you? Yes. Are they in tonight? Yeah, straight huh? there. Oh, they're over there. Ah, oh, excellent. And you get pocket money? Yeah. Okay, my final question, just hypothetically, your pocket money, mm -hmm. you wouldn't mind giving all of that to, let's say, your sister for the next roughly five years? No. No? <laughs> hmm. That's your sister, right? Yeah. Don't worry, I've got you. <laughs> I've decided to give my sister all of my pocket money for the next five, 10, 20 years. <laughs> she deserves it, you know, she's just, she's better than me, she can have it. And she can have all of my desserts too. I don't need those. And she can also have my phone and my room, which is where she can keep all of my clothes because they are now hers. Wow, and that is your face. So thank you very much for coming along. No problem. No, not you, your face. Thanks, it's been wonderful to be here and I completely stand by all of my answers. To all of this, because whether you're talking about deep fakes or driverless cars or facial recognition, under the surface, all of these things that have such potential to change our world, they're ultimately mathematical creations. And maths isn't just about bridges and bicycles and buildings. Behind the scenes, it's mathematical levers that are powering the changes to our society. It's got the potential to change everything, what we know, how we talk to each other, even how our whole democracy is structured. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't think this is about being afraid of the advancement of machines, but I do think that we need to be honest with ourselves about the awesome power of mathematics. And I think we need to be careful of the very real limitations of something that will never be perfect. But, you know, I think if we can be aware of the pitfalls, if we can work our way around the challenges, I am optimistic about a future where humans and machines can work together, exploiting each other's strengths and acknowledging each other's weaknesses, a partnership that has the real potential to be a force for good. And so to finish, let's combine human and machine in a performance of collaboration. Please welcome the Chinake Orchestra. <laughs> Your job is to guess which parts are human and which with a mathematical algorithm. Enjoy. Mm -hmm. 